We are back for another episode. So today we'll be follow up on uh, what we did last week, and uh, it was uh, modern day illnesses. And we talked about insulin resistance, things like that, uh, basically what to check in your blood work, if there is something like that already happening with you or uh, may, may be about to happen or has happened in past, what to look for in blood tests and stuff, and how to actually take care of that. So from all that, we now moving on to something that usually is linked to everything we discussed in previous video, which is hypothyroidism. Uh, what really is that? And where can we find that in our blood test? And maybe explain as well why it is so important to take thorough blood test when someone starts tracking their health. Because oftentimes, uh, some people don't appreciate and they will go to their doctor and doctor will just say, oh, if you feel tired, we'll just check these two or three hormones. But that doesn't really say anything about your health. Yeah, especially when it comes to thyroid, the main thing that I see that doctors will check is TSH and nothing else. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just not enough. It just really isn't. You need at least TSH, free T3, free T4, and ideally reverse T3 as well. Those, so that's four markers um, that you need to really see what's going on with your thyroid. And then if those markers are out of whack, uh, then you know there's the possibilities of Hashimoto's, but too many doctors I see diagnosing clients with Hashimoto's without doing a proper antibody test for thyroid antibodies. So I just wanted to make you know, I see that because a lot of women are getting misdiagnosed with Hashimoto's when in fact, that's just hypothyroidism, which is different. Um, I'll just kind of briefly explain the differences. Hashimoto's means that your antibodies for your thyroid are elevated. So your body's kind of autoimmune to your thyroid. Um, so it's attacking your thyroid. Whereas hypothyroidism is the underproduction of thyroid hormones. So though that's the distinction. And if you just have hypothyroidism, then this is something that you can fix. Um, if you have actual Hashimoto's, it's something that you will uh, mitigate in the short term, but depending on what you're willing to do could be also reversed, but that's a lot more in intensive. That would involve probably moving, uh, probably changing your environment very, very drastically, if possible. So talk about what, what is hypothyroidism and how can you maybe start guessing that you might have it before you even do blood test? Is there some kind of takeaways? Like we, we know if you're insulin resistant and whatnot, uh, you were explaining about how it must be harder to turn. Uh, you have yes, energy so, so, and all those kind of things. So what about this? Will be almost identical. So yes, if you have hypothyroidism, uh, you're going to be harder to tan, but it'll be a little bit more aggressive than even if you just had diet like uh, insulin resistance. Uh, and what I mean by that is you might even come to think that you are allergic to the sun. So not only do you suck at tanning, but you actually get like an allergic reaction, like a rash, uh, whenever you get out to the sun, because thyroid uh, hormones are directly linked to UV light and cold. And if you dysregulate that system long enough, uh, then the only way to kind of kick them back in line is with cold and not just sunlight exposure. So if you, you know, haven't gotten blood work for a long time, but you live indoors and you're, you know, really lethargic, low motivation, and you're struggling to kind of just almost like be active in general, right? Then I would be like, yeah, let's look into your thyroid. But if you also told me, hey, by the way, when I go out in the sun, I'm kind of allergic to the sun. I'm photosensitive. Um, that's a big red flag that this has been going on for a long time. And your blood work will most certainly show uh, that your thyroid's underperforming. Um, and I think this is this is really important that you acknowledge that that you need to know about person. Again, you can't just go do a blood test and then get a report from your doctor telling you what to do because they don't know anything about your lifestyle. How can they advise you anything? Uh, yeah. We have mentioned before, like you have seen my blood work. 
And for someone who is not well versed in all this, they would just go, this person is quite messed up. But you know my lifestyle and you're like, this is perfect for you. If you yeah. didn't have this, you would not be able to function as well as you do. That's very true. Yeah, yeah I, I fully believe that with your blood work because I know who you are. I know what you're doing, that sort of stuff. Um, and then tying it back to exactly what I said before this, um, the the reason why that key information of that person of like photosensitivity or lack of tanning is very important is because hypothyroidism doesn't always show red marks on your blood work. In other words, your T3, depending on the lab, the range is different. So it might not be flagged and you your your eye might not be drawn to it. Whereas with me, I've seen enough of it that it goes, okay, if your TSH is here and your T4 is here, I expect your thyroid, your T3 to be here. That oftentimes what I'll see uh, is a combination of two scenarios. TSH will be normal and uh, free T4 will be actually really good. Like the level is nice and high, but free T4 is not active. In other words, it's not running the metabolism um, like T3 is, uh, especially in the brain. And so, but then we'll, then I'll go and look at their free T3 and it's underperforming compared to their T4. It's actually at the lower end of the scale, maybe not flagged, but definitely on the lower end. Uh, in American numbers, that's something like a 2.7 or lower. The cutoff isn't even a, it's not until 1.9 and that's way too low. Um, you'll start experiencing symptoms at like 2.3, 2.4. And if you're really sensitive to this, you might even experience symptoms at 2.6 or 2.7. The ideal range would be something above three. Um, and so that's where you, that's why I need all of these. You cannot just send me, you know, for, for hypothyroidism, you can't just send me TSH and free T4 or even worse, total T4. That doesn't tell me Jack. That doesn't tell me anything. Uh, it doesn't tell me how you're processing it and stuff like that. Um, so those types of things might not be flagged, but you combine those numbers of, Hey, these are kind of underperforming. They're a little bit weird as far as like the, the, how I see them fitting. And then you tell me something like, Hey, by the way, I can't tan very well, or I'm photosensitive or, or, Hey, I just burn. I don't tan at all. Then, then it becomes, okay, well, that's probably going back to more of the details that we talked about in the previous video of how sunlight influences those things. But if you do them incorrectly long enough, you've been indoors, right? Your modern lifestyle has kept you inside for a long yeah, enough time. Yeah. Two years you were told to sit at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Two years you were told to sit at home. And oh, by the way, you can work from home remotely. So now screens are shining into your eyes and making you blue light toxic, raising your blood sugar, probably, but more importantly, damaging DHA, because DHA, we've talked about DHA before, when it comes to fatty fish consumption, DHA is highly, highly concentrated in your eye and in your brain, and pretty much the rest of the nervous system, but those two places where it starts to be the most concentrated, that actively gets destroyed by blue light, and you might not get insulin resistance you might end up with hypothyroidism first mm -hmm. um, through that mechanism because the eye and uh the skin on your face it has a direct link basically right to the brain and specifically the paraventricular nucleus which is where thyroid releasing hormone gets excreted that neuron there is directly at the paraventricular nucleus right right in your brain so if the DHA gets destroyed there first, you're going to end up with hypothyroidism first. Um, and so that's where, you know, if it's been long enough, you're going to have a lot of photosensitivity issues, even to the point where maybe, uh, you know, I mentioned the tanning and the allergic part of the skin, but probably the earliest sign is, hey, I cannot go outside without sunglasses on. I phys My eyes physically hurt if I go outside without yeah. sunglasses on then that's a big red flag that I go, okay, I probably like, let's get some blood work, but right away, I'm going to, I, I need all these markers of thyroid because I'm looking into that right away. And then that would also probably hit me off to be like, by the way, we also need a omega-3 test 
to see what your omega-3 index is, how much DHA have you destroyed, to know how much pressure I need to put on with fatty fish and possibly even doubling up and taking some fish oil supplements along with it. Um, because bringing up your DHA content will take a lot longer uh, than anything else because it has to be made into the cells as your body regenerates cells. That just because you consume it isn't going to saturate things. Mm -hmm. You have to consume it regularly and then your body has to go through its normal cell turnover to be able to fix that part. So it just takes a long time. It's similar to like creatine. You just can't take it one day and then forget about it. You need to kind of be consistent all year round to, to get the most out of it. Yeah, yeah. Very, very similar in the way of like just saturating the system and then keeping it saturated. Mm. And um, so, you know, I, I briefly touched on the very first hormone uh, when it comes to how light affects uh, mechanisms in the eye and the brain, which is thyroid releasing hormone. And the thing that regulates thyroid releasing hormone directly is leptin. Now we've briefly might have touched on it here and there. Leptin is mainly located underneath this or at the subcutaneous level of your skin. And the thing that kind of activates it is sunlight, right? So if you're lacking a lot of sunlight, you're directly inhibiting the leptin's action. And everybody's maybe heard of being leptin resistant. And that happens way before insulin resistance, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah. Make, make sure you explain what leptin does. Yeah, yeah. So leptin is a very crucial, uh, almost, almost like an antioxidant kind of uh, like uh, melatonin, where it is, was developed evolutionarily as a uh, semiconductor for conducting uh, and managing stress and managing uh, the environment. That's why it's located where it's located, right at the subcutaneous level of your skin. And that leptin hormone, we know that it regulates hunger, it regulates uh, the, the drive for food, it regulates even other things uh, like uh, sexual function, it regulates dopamine, uh, just pretty much everything that we're going to be talking about for the next part is very crucial. And the fact that it directly stimulates thyroid releasing hormone tell, also tells you that it, it regulates your metabolism. Mm -hmm. So that it's even before the thyroid, right? Everybody kind of knows that thyroid is my metabolism. I must have a slow metabolism. My thyroid must be off. Well, if your thyroid is off, then that means that you are leptin resistant and leptin is not doing its thing, which means how do we activate leptin? By making sure that we get you out in the sun at appropriate times of the day with yeah. as little, and, and that's that's why the, the previous video was like, hey, the tanning thing, that's a big deal. It, it is a big deal because it starts to tie directly into master hormones like leptin and uh, melatonin. Um, and this is something that we mentioned many videos before. Why, for myself and you, preference would be go outside and do your cardio work, so so to say, because that will give you results quicker. And that is my personal preference. I'll just go outside instead of going to the gym and going on a treadmill. Yeah, absolutely, because you're going to gain a lot more out of it. Um, because I, um, uh, leptin is very tied to something called alpha MSH or melanocortin stimulating hormone. That is the tanning hormone. And those all come from palm seed. And we talked about it last episode. Uh, and that's a uh, pro opio melanocortin. That's what it stands for. And in the last episode, I talked about how that palm seed gets sliced into AC. ETH and CLIP, which are insulin insulin secreting and blood sugar raising. The other thing that it gets sliced into is uh, lipoprotein, which stimulates melanocytes and uh, activates uh, the ability to use energy, lipolysis and stuff like that. It also gets sliced into beta endorphin, which is a uh, form of uh, opioid. So in other words, it releases that because we're supposed to be addicted to the sun. Like we're supposed to seek it out, which is also why certain drugs are incredibly addictive, opioid drugs to be specific, because it's literally capitalizing on something that we have already built in within us to be addicted to the sun. 
and then the last thing that it also gets sliced into is alpha MSH, which is the tanning uh, part, beta MSH, and gamma MSH. Those three MSHs are crucial for brain development, crucial for energy, uh, homeostasis, appetite, all of those things, because some of them stimulate leptin, some of them stimulate mel uh, melatonin, uh, and those types of things. So, and, and this is also highlights what we have mentioned many times before that there is a reason why we don't talk about nutrition as much. This needs to be taken care of first. Yeah, absolutely. You can, you can go your keto, carnivore, whatever there is. If your environment doesn't support your nutritional strategy, you, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, because you're you're basically fighting your environment at that point. You're trying to fight it with food, and that's a failing effort because your environment is that powerful to regulate master hormones like this. Mm. And then the, the next thing uh, that... Uh, you know, we left them directly uh, emphasize this thyroid releasing hormone. And then T4 and T3 uh, are interlinked through sunlight cycles, specifically T3 being converted from T4 at specific times of the day and T4 being stimulated to be released through thyroid releasing hormone at specific times of the day. This is where uh, morning daylight and blue light blocking glasses or mitigating blue light exposure after dark play a key role. So now I'm going to explain how these two things that we've been preaching for, for a while um, have major impacts on your thyroid releasing hormone and the thyroid hormones themselves. At night, you are meant to release thyroid hormones. And they're just barely kind of starting to catch on to this in the mainstream medical field. Normally, they tell you if they're replacing your thyroid with thyroid hormones, they tell them to take it in the morning. They're starting to kind of move away from that and starting to get people to take it at night because they've realized that that's when it's actually being manufactured. Mm -hmm. So the lack of blue light, uh, we know that uh, raises melatonin and other nighttime hormones. And one of those is the creation of T4 because it's inactive. So it's okay to raise it and manufacture it because it's not going to stimulate you to be awake. Mm. Then in the early parts of the day, T4 starts to get converted to T3. That's gonna raise your body temperature and start to wake you up naturally. But only if your body understands those times of the day. Mm. And the only way that it's gonna be able to tell that is at night, the lack of blue light and the dimming of light in general, and in the morning, it will start to understand, hey, this is when this person saw sunlight. So it will dial back about three hours to start converting T4 to T3 so that you're awake and active when you've been seeing sunlight. But if you never see sunlight, then it doesn't understand when to convert because it's not going to do it indiscriminately because that would be a bad thing to just keep you awake, right? Like if it's waking you up when it shouldn't be waking you up, it's just going to default to only making the bare minimum. Yeah, and this is why jet lag is, is affecting us so bad because when you travel a lot, all of this is getting just thrown out of the window. And we're probably mm -hmm. going to touch up on that at some point as well. You know, you can do some grounding and quite a lot of things to get your body back in check as quick as you can. Uh, we kind of touch up on that on our force recovery video. Uh, but there, there's... Yes. So much more we can talk about uh, so is there anything else that you can physically feel when you have hypothyroidism maybe cold feet cold hands anything like that those are secondary things right so that's when it's been sorry you back up a little bit what did you say yes that those are secondary things that's those are going to happen when it's been like you've already had hypothyroidism or like low thyroid in general for a, quite a while um things like cold hands, cold feet, because T3 regulates body temperature. Like I just barely stated before, if it's can chronically low all the time, then yes, you are going to have cold hands, cold feet, even though the temperature inside is 70. And it's almost like you have to keep turning it up because you feel cold all the time. That is literally a dysregulation from you're disconnected from the sun for way too long um, because uh, that will do that now. If it's gotten to the point that you're getting cold hands and cold feet, what I tend to see 
brings the quickest reversal is combining sunlight with intentional cold therapy. Because from an evolutionary standpoint, mammals survived the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. Everybody kind of knows that that's pretty much well accepted. And the reason why the dinosaurs died is because photosynthesis was disrupted. Uh, in other words, it was dark. It was dark and cold uh, for a long enough time that it disrupted plants and all the animals that eat those plants. Mammals at that point in time were just furry little creatures in the ground. Um, so how did they survive with no sun and the rest died? Theropod, dinosaur, theropod dinosaurs, which are birds, they could just fly away, right? They could just fly to places where it wasn't quite as disrupted. But mammals couldn't do that. The way they survive is this mechanism that we described in the last video where they have a mechanism to make their own blood sugar so they're not dependent on carbohydrates, uh, at least not year round. And the other thing that they evolved is how do they keep their circadian rhythm without sunrises and sunsets that you could distinguish? And this is how. Even when the sun is not visible, like really cloudy days or when it's snowing, when the sun rises, it still lets infrared light through the clouds. So that means the daytime, even though there isn't sun, is still going to be warmer than the nighttime. And then there's this effect at the, at the, uh, the twilight hours of the day where they are the coldest. So anybody that watches the weather for any extent period of time, you will notice that over a 24 hour period, the coldest points in the day are sunrise and sunset. Because even in the middle of the night, it will be slightly warmer than at those points in time. So the mechanism, the circadian mechanism in mammals is actually two of them. One is, the primary one is sunlight. The secondary backup system is cold. So if you're indoors all the time and you're lacking thyroid hormones, how do we start pumping them up even if we can't get you outside regularly or you live somewhere where it's winter? Then what you do is you start embracing the cold at those points in time of the day. Because the other thing that kind of leads to the downfall of this is that you have a thermostat indoors, which means temperature is static year round. So... There is no secondary mechanism for your body to key in on to start regulating your circadian rhythm of thyroid production. So when you combine it with some sunlight viewing and some cold therapy in the morning and some sunlight therapy or uh, daylight viewing and cold therapy in the evening, you're expanding or, or creating a bigger stimulus for your uh, thyroid mechanisms. So that actually is counterintuitive you know, because of what you said, hey, my hands and feet are always cold. I'm turning up the thermostat. I'm like, no, the thing you want to do is you actually want to embrace the cold specifically at these times of the day and let your body warm up, you know, thermostat wise or outside at different times of the day. But you, in those morning and evening times, embracing the cold is actually going to start stimulating the release of thyroid. Yeah, yeah, I, I observe it a lot. And uh, this is the first question I ask you if to find out how far off they are and if that pops up i'm like yeah we definitely need to run a thorough blood test and see what's where uh but it's, it's very interesting in the sense of uh where does food come in play to fix in all this so i'm glad you asked that if yes. you have everything lined up what what's next yeah so it we talked briefly on how this kind of starts to get manifested by being indoors and having blue light in your eye with the destruction of DHA. So we bring in some fatty fish and then depending on how bad it is, even some fish oil pills. But there are two very key nutrients, uh, well, actually three, um, in thyroid manufacturing and the conversion of T4 to T3. So we'll start with the, the manufacturing part. Uh, not a lot of, well, maybe a lot of people will know this, but the reason why thyroid is called thyroid is because it has iodine, right? Uh, T4 has four iodine molecules, T3 has three, T2 has two, et cetera. So iodine becomes incredibly important uh, for the manufacturing of the actual thyroid hormones. And then that's going to be 
kind of like what gets secreted from your thyroid gland, which is mainly T4 and a little bit of T3. Then there's the whole conversion bit. Now, I, we won't get into the dance quite a lot besides what I already said, which is T4 gets converted to T3. The conversion process there when it comes to nutrients is dependent on zinc and selenium. Those are the dopants. And dopants means that um, kind of like, um, if, like I touched on before, melanin is dark, so it collects all in a uh, spectrum of light. And white kind of collects less, and, but certain colors collect certain frequencies. Zinc and selenium are certain colors. They're the dopant for the, the diodinase enzyme that converts T4 to T3. In other words, certain lights, that's why, that's why sunlight in the morning is the thing that keys T4 to turn into T3 because the sunlight in the morning is a certain color which reacts with the certain colors of zinc and selenium. They're the dopants, okay? So now I laid out those three nutrients, iodine, zinc, and selenium. Where are they found in abundance in cold water seafood? They are found in ridiculous abundance, plus it comes with DHA. So if there's one nutritional thing that I do focus in on, is cold water seafood, fatty fish. So that's salmon, herring, oysters, sardines, all the fish and stuff people don't like to eat. Those are the things you should be capitalizing on because those bring all the necessary nutrients all in one neatly packaged. I don't even think of it as a food. I think of it as a medicine because if you have this problem, that's the thing that you can consume regularly without overdosing or any of that. And some people might even object and be like, well, maybe they have a little mercury. Well, that might be true, but guess what the, uh, how would I say, the remedy to having some mercury in there, high amounts of selenium, which they do have. So if you eat the whole food package, it comes with the solutions with it. It comes the, with the solutions for this, the minerals, the iodine, the selenium, the zinc. And if there is a little bit of mercury in it, it's kind of be null and void because of those densely packed nutrients. Too many people try to supplement these nutrients. They just don't work nearly as good because you don't know the ratio of zinc, the ratio of selenium and, and iodine that needs to consistently go into your body. Your body's going to sort all, all out because the food already has that uh, how would I say, a uh, quality control system already built into it, right? Because nature already put the fish where it needs to be. It already gets the right amount of sunlight to control the atom spin of zinc and selenium. So it's already doing all of that for you. It's basically like your own incredibly sophisticated pharmacy that's already built it for you. You just need to put it in your mouth. Yeah, and it's something that we have mentioned before is that... Uh processed food is nowhere near as good as even substituting your food macro to macro, micronutrient to micronutrient with something that comes in a powder or sachet or whatnot. Like I'm playing around at the moment, checking my blood sugar levels. And uh, only things that messes up my blood sugar levels is drinking protein shake, just protein, nothing else, no carbs in it or nothing else. And that's only things that absolutely messes up my blood sugar levels. Whereas if I eat yeah. normal food, my body will stay normal, stay sane. And this is why my personal preference is if you want to gain a lot of muscle, don't fall for the nonsense of dirty bulk. I'm like, why would you want to feel lethargic and at, at expense of what? You can literally increase your appetite, get bigger, stronger by just training a bit more athletic and taking care of your recovery processes with as much diligence as you do with your training. Anyone know how to train hard? No one wants to recover hard. <laughs> and this yeah. is where these kind of things come in place, your daily habits, daily routines, understanding when to do what, because circadian rhythm is something we can teach our body to get back into normal range. Uh, because let's be honest, all of us at the moment, we live the lifestyle that teaches it to be out of harmony the way it should be. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then that I, that's kind of where I want to leave the hypothyroid as a traditional sense, right? Like how does that affect your metabolism? How, where are the things that you need to do? We coupled the cold and the sunlight 
the actual nutrients that you need to focus on, which is really one food. Um, but now I want to touch on a little bit specifically on thyroid releasing hormone. At the beginning, I said, you know, thyroid releasing hormone is made by your paraventricular nucleus. It does all these things with thyroid itself, but you also have thyroid releasing hormone expression in your guts. So in your intestines. So because you mentioned about uh, metabolism and like hunger and appetite and stuff like that, that thyroid expression is also in your pancreas and also in your esophagus. So the muscles in your esophagus. So it regulates if you, if you kind of, I'm going to tie it all together, thyroid releasing hormone also regulates how the smooth muscles operate in your intestines to move food through your system, right? Because that's your metabolism right? So it's going to regulate that for you. So if you have thyroid releasing hormone disruption, you're going to have things like GERD. You're going to have things like too much uh, gastric acid secretion. So uh, you're going to be taking things like um, anti-acids and stuff like that all the time, or just randomly, you're like, I don't know what I ate, but I have so much disruption with my uh, acid production. These are things that are regulated by thyroid releasing hormone right? So now you start to see how your brain and your gut are kind of linked because of hormones that get made here that initially got disrupted by what's going on in here. Yeah, and we uh, more often than not see this uh, in people who have completed bodybuilding prep, when they start eating a lot of processed food after eating really high quality food for a very long time. And now they just can't control the appetite. And as soon as they touch a little bit of processed food, they cannot stop mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. they get gastric acid and they have a lot of issues and uh, which which can lead to all, all kind of stuff yeah yeah and i mean if you think about it they they probably were doing lots of cardio or training even harder so more and more time in, inside a gym with a lot of fake lighting plus on top of that the system goes backwards right so if you disrupt things here you're also going to work backwards in that trh uh, or thyroid releasing hormone system back towards the other way to your brain. So now thyroid, because we know this, right? Thyroid gets downregulated the more you disrupt uh, uh, digestion, whether that's caloric restriction or other things of that nature, that system works both ways. It's a two-way street, not just a one-way street. So yeah, that, that's exactly, this is the system that you're talking about when those things get dysregulated. Yeah, and this is why uh, we emphasize that you probably need to encourage new identity of being leaner, stronger, more muscular you, instead of falling for the, hey, I need to get ready in six weeks for this one event once a year, and then forget about it and then do it next year as well. Because that kind of lifestyle is not only not rewarding, but it's unhealthy. Now, our goal yeah. as such is to educate people how to stay healthy all year round, how to feel great all year round, how to fail, how to stay aesthetically pleasing all year round and perform at your best instead of, hey, this is how you get shredded in six weeks. That that kind of nonsense doesn't interest any of us. We can do that yeah. with anyone, but it, it's not rewarded. I have the best compliments when I get people to tell me, wow, you look great. You you always look great. I'm like, yeah, that's the goal. My goal is not to make massive kind of improvements or something my goal is now is just to stay as, as as good as i can for as long as i can because let's be honest i stopped progressing my strengths when i was 21 i was at my strongest in my early 20s that, that was it and i'm still as strong as i was i'm only much heavier now <laughs> that's the only difference you know i started to train with purpose of being inefficient which is hypertrophy training you know hypertrophy training is not as how how strong you are it's how inefficient you can become with your movements so you kind of start storing more glycogen you can tolerate more pain and all those kind of things uh, but yeah this is this is really insightful about understanding what people are missing when they are reaching out to somebody hey can you help me to lose this little bit of extra body weight or get me a bit more energy in, in my body and this and that and more often than not what i see is they don't even do a thorough blood test and I'm like, I can't advise you on anything if, if I don't know this. If someone else you reached out has given you advice, they probably mean the best, but they don't know what they don't know. And what they don't know is that you need to be healthy first. 
anyone can be in calorie deficit and get some kind of results and behind closed doors just be miserable agitated easily and have low energy and just survive on stimulants all day just just to keep some kind of sanity in their mind yeah and that will always be temporary at best so following up on this we we touched up on uh insulin resistance which i've stopped touched up on hypothyroidism where do you think uh this leads in sense of what else is there that is affected by modern day lifestyle or are these two main things that are really obvious is really easy to catch and also really easy to fix if you actually put an effort into wanting to fix these things yeah so these are the main two be mainly because they're regulating how you process energy and how you manifest that energy okay and so then how does this lead to other problems because these can progress right it doesn't stop at hypothyroidism or insulin resistant the next step down and this will probably be discussed on the next episode is how does thyroid relate to sex hormones and how does that lead to things like infertility uh and uh disruption of your sex hormones and everything that we've talked about in this last episode and this episode tie hand in hand with how those affect sex hormones and that will probably be pretty interested to some people and things of that nature the the, the you know because if your metabolism is screwed up then your body goes, hey, we don't need to reproduce. This this person is unhealthy to reproduce, right? Just going, literally quoting what you just said, you have to be healthy first before you can optimize things and be spectacular. Your, your biology already understands that. If metabolism gets dysregulated too far, it turns off sex hormone production. They're linked in a very uh, unique way. And that's probably something that we will kind of, touch on maybe next time yeah. of how yeah. that starts to happen and yeah it's all linked together yeah absolutely and uh this is what we both see is that oftentimes people look into sex hormones before everything else whereas that is a consequence a of everything else yeah yeah, yeah. 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 These are sex the hormones is a bit too late already and, and more often than not they don't really tell you anything anyway you kind of like, no, 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 yeah, no. okay, I was expecting this anyway, but let me see if this is what I think it is that's causing it. So, yeah. now, David, as usual, thanks for your time. I'm not going to hold you any longer. I uh, appreciate you uh, jumping on this. And uh, next week, we're going we're gonna to touch up on sex hormones and dig deep into what's where, how. Awesome. Awesome. Speak to you soon.